Good morning, church. Welcome to another week of Church Online here from beautiful Bayfield, Ontario. We are at the cottage in the hot sun. It's a wonderful day. And I have a few things that I want to uh, say to you just before we get into worship this morning. Uh, so we have a chat room. Click the like button if you like something that's being said. If you need prayer at all today, we have a prayer button. And then it'll bring you into a private chat room where one of our prayer partners is standing by to pray with you for whatever you have need of. Uh, and then also, if you uh, are new with us, we have a Get Connected button that you can click throughout the service to let us know that you are here. As well, if you're a regular attender, online services, let us know that you uh, were at church today. Make sure you're active in the comment section and and uh, yeah, that's about all. Let's worship together. God, we thank you for your presence. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we're just going to worship you today, wherever we are. Lord, we thank you that your presence is where we gather. And uh, Lord, your presence is where we worship. And so God, have your way today. And Lord, be glorified as we worship. Yes. Amen. Sing, there is a sound. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear worship, he hears faith. Ooh, yeah. There is a sound. I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe As he walks into the room Where people pray Where we hear worship He hears faith We worship you Sing awake Awake my soul And sing Sing his praise aloud Sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise aloud. Slumbering, it's time to worship him. Awake, my soul, and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake, my soul, and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise. praise we could ever bring 
Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Sing worthy Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Sing holy Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Sing Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Oh, holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around Sing holy, holy There is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love To those around me Sing, I will build I will build my life upon your love It is a firm foundation And I will put my trust in you alone And I will not be shaken I will
center of it all Jesus be the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus And Jesus be the center of my life Jesus be the center of my life From beginning to the end It will always be, it's always been you, Jesus Jesus, cause nothing else matters Nothing in this world will do Jesus, you're the center And everything revolves around you Jesus, you at the center of it all Oh, be the center of it all Sing, Jesus, be the center Jesus be the center of it all Oh, Jesus be the center of it all From beginning to the end It will always be and it's always been you, Jesus Oh, Jesus, nothing else matters It's all about you From my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you From my heart to the heavens Jesus be the center It's all about you Yes, it's all about you From my heart Of your church. So Jesus be the center of your church. Oh, Jesus be the center of your church. From beginning to the end, it will always be, and it's always been you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, sing it out. Jesus, we're putting you at the right Jesus, the center of it all Jesus, we lift you Oh, we lift your name Jesus, Jesus Oh, Jesus, nothing else matters And nothing in this world will do Center, and everything revolves 
still tore before you You silenced the boast of sin and grave And the heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised to life again Cause you have no rival And you have no equal And now and forever God you reign Cause yours is the kingdom And yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names What a powerful name it is Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence in this place. God, we thank you for your promise wherever two or more are gathered in your name. That which they ask, Father, it will be given to them. And so this morning we have some prayer requests we want to lift up before the Lord. And uh, one of them is... Uh, continued spread of coronavirus uh, throughout the world and including we're thinking of India today uh, where there's many that are also uh, suffering from starvation so we're praying that relief efforts would reach them and that the spirit of God the gospel of Jesus Christ would reach people uh, in those most hurting places also we want to continue to lift up uh, families marriages and families here in our church community uh, that could be facing some hard times. Uh, so why don't you just take a few moments right now and lift those two things up before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for India right now. And God, we're just asking that you would just move and do a work. God, we pray that there would be um, relief efforts that would reach those people in those places, God, that there would be um, people who would be reached for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, that you would even um, stop the spread of coronavirus, Lord. Lord, we know that your word says that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you would raise up a standard against him. And so, Father, we just pray that a standard would be uh, raised up in the nation of India. Lord, that the gospel would reach hearts. It would reach the hearts of many, God. I pray that even as this virus would spread, Lord, that your gospel would spread even quicker. And I thank you, Father, for the power of the word of God, the power of healing. I thank you for those in the church, in that nation, Lord, that you would strengthen them, that you would minister to them. And I thank you even for those on our ground and on our soil, Father, where um, nation, or families and marriages, Lord, that could be in crisis right now or could be struggling, Father, parents. Uh, and Lord, I just pray for that you would strengthen the family in Canada, God, that you would strengthen families in CLC, God, that your spirit would minister, that there would be a, a release of fresh grace and fresh anointing uh, and fresh oil into families, God. I just thank you for strengthening your people and strengthening uh, uh, families, marriages, children, oh God. We thank Thank you for that in Jesus mighty name and all God's people said amen thank you for worshiping with us today hi we are so excited that you are joining us for CLC online we'd love for you to let us know you're here click the get connected button at the top right of your screen or follow the link in the description if you're not joining us live there's also buttons or links to connect you to our giving page, kids ministry videos, and life groups. You can also access all this and more by downloading our app to your device. Just search Crossroads Life Church wherever you download apps and you'll find it there. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. We wanna to continue to trust God in this way. We have three different ways that you can give. You can give through Tithely, which is found on our app. You can give through Interact e-transfers, or through checks sent through the mail marked with your name and the designation. For e-transfers, make sure you check out the details on our website giving page so that it gets added to your year-end tax donation receipt. We are so glad you're here and we hope you enjoy the rest of the service at CLC Online.
Good day, church. Uh, so uh, happy to be coming to you again and uh, hoping that many of you are gathered in homes and having some watch parties. Jan and I had our first watch party last Sunday and had uh, about eight or nine people in and just had a great time, just a really great time. Worship, fellowship, and uh, it was re really good to be able to connect <clears throat> with uh, people in our church. And so I hope that you're doing that and uh, hope that you'll remember people who might be outside of your social circle to invite them into and bring them in uh, <clears throat> and make sure that we're all caring for one another uh, during these days when we're unable to kind of come together and do the whole, uh, whole enchilada, the whole corporate thing. So last Sunday, <clears throat> I was sharing with you in this series, Keeping It Real with Jesus. And uh, this week, I want to kind of take things in a little different direction. And, um, you know, while Jesus strongly urged his followers not to be condemning and judgmental, on the other hand, there is a lot in the Gospels about exercising proper discernment. And one troubling area that Jesus warns about are false prophets, false teachers, and even false Christs. And uh, why is this important? And how do we make such determinations? How can we uh, be safe from those kind of things? Well, first of all, I want to start out by saying that there are scores of people out there who belong to what I call the doctrine police. <clears throat> you know, there are people who um, are calling all kinds of people false teachers and false prophets because their teaching may not agree with what they were taught. These are typically... Uh, you know, the doctrine police are typically non-charismatic teachers uh, who, who largely disagree with anyone who believes in healing, prophecy, speaking in tongues, miracles, and other manifestations of the Holy Spirit that are clearly taught in, in the New Testament, practiced by the early church, endorsed by the early church fathers, and widely, very widely accepted today. So, <clears throat> I want to emphatically say that that is not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about having, uh, or I'm sorry, he was not talking about having a disagreement over a doctrinal emphasis and then writing people off because of it. Uh, that is sheer nonsense. And he was not talking about people who approach worship uh, differently than we do and, you know, calling them false. Uh, he was not talking about people who can get into some doctrinal stuff wrong uh, because of a lack of maybe a scholarly approach to Scripture. And while that can be troubling, and it can lead to extremes or even weakness in uh, discipleship in a church or in a movement, uh, it doesn't necessarily make them false. In fact, let me just say this right here, that for well over uh, a thousand years, the test of orthodoxy, uh, or the, you know, the test that a preacher or a group was on solid ground in the faith, uh, was their adherence to the confession of the creeds, mainly the Apostles' Creed, and then secondly, the Nicene Creed. So those, those creeds, if, if churches and leaders and movements uh, subscribed to them, they were considered orthodox. And it didn't allow for debates into you know, finer details of, of theology. So we should not be like the disciples who one day they saw a guy who was casting out demons and preaching the gospel and they forbid him and they came and actually reported it to Jesus. Jesus, we really rebuked someone today, Jesus. We, man, it was amazing. This guy was casting out demons in your name and we stopped him. <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, but Jesus corrected them. He said, don't do that. For he who is not against us is on our side. Mark chapter 9, verse 40. So let's go to our text and see if we can get some direction and some help uh, with this area that we're going to talk about. This is taken from Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 15 to 20. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. 
Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Let's pray. Father, today again, we just are so thankful to be able to come together to uh, worship as we did this morning uh, and worship your name, sing your praise, give thanks to you, be with some of our church family and just celebrate the goodness of the Lord in these times that are so strange, so challenging to navigate. But we thank you that you're with us. And today we ask you, Father, that by the Holy Spirit, you would breathe on us, open our understanding, give us wisdom and insight into your word, and help us to keep it real with Jesus. And Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and every, everybody said. All right. So this scripture warns about false prophets or pseudo-prophets is actually uh, the proper Greek translation. And uh, <clears throat> false prophets, false teachers, false Christ. And each of them are actually spoken of in uh, different contexts. But let's start with the false prophets. Jesus said that they come in sheep's clothing. So they look like sheep, they smell like sheep, but there's something that is false. And it's not detected upon the first appearance, but over time. So Jesus says that inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. This means that they are driven and uh, operating by an inner motivation that's not pure, it's not right, it's not of Christ. So let's start out by looking at what was driving Jesus. Because we know that when we look at Jesus, he is the standard, the benchmark for whom we observe what all true ministry and all true ministries are all about. Three statements I want to share with you that Jesus said, kind of like a mission statement, that reveals something about what was driving him, that what his inner motivation was. First of all, the first one is found in John 10, 11, where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So, very important there that the good shepherd and, and any good shepherd is, is expending their life so that the sheep can have life. A good shepherd is someone who's pouring out of their life so that the sheep are protected, the sheep are cared for, the sheep are fed, they're, look, they're looked after, okay? And uh, it's a giving posture. He says uh, he gives his life for the sheep. Then the second scripture is found in Luke 19, 10. Jesus says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. So Jesus was on a seek and rescue mission looking for the lost people. Good shepherds care about the lost. They, care, they don't just care about the people who are in the flock now, but they lift up their eyes beyond that and they want to see people from the community, people who are lost, people who don't know Jesus, people who have no connection with God. They're concerned about them and they want to see them enfolded into the flock. And so that's another important aspect that they have a heart for lost people. And then Matthew uh, 28, uh, 20, 28, uh, Jesus made this statement. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Kind of a similar uh, scripture that ties both of those thoughts together. But I think what I'd like to pull out of this is that Jesus came not to be served. He, people were just waiting on him day and night, and he was just sitting around with his feet up, and everybody was serving him. No, no. Jesus was out there. He was giving of his life. He was preaching. He was teaching. He was healing the sick. He was cleansing the lepers. He was going from town to town ministering and, uh, and giving of himself and, giving, and, and ultimately giving his life a ransom for many. So the first major distinctive that Jesus points out about false or pseudo prophets is interestingly enough it's not false or inaccurate prophecy. And a lot of people say well this guy prophesied this and it didn't come to pass. He's a false prophet. Well Jesus doesn't even go there. Doesn't even talk about whether their prophecy is accurate or inaccurate. And in the New Testament actually you know there, there is some mixture 
Uh, not everybody uh, bats a thousand or is a hundred percent accurate in prophecy. We prophesy according to the measure of faith, and it's possible that a prophet can actually miss something. That does not make them a false prophet. What makes them a false prophet is something that is in their character, or you might say something that is not in their character. And Jesus says they are wolves disguised as sheep. Something I think we all understand about a wolf is that a wolf is a master consumer. Uh, he's only in among the sheep for what he can get out of it. And uh, he's not there to contribute anything but only to receive something. He's not there to give. He's not there to share. He's not there to lay down his life. That's the last thing uh, on, the, on the mind of a wolf. He is there to devour, to consume, to get for himself. You know, interesting quote by Benjamin Franklin. He said, democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what they're going to have for lunch. And liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. Now, although we're not talking about democracy, that illustration aptly communicates the relationship between wolves and lambs. And again, although Franklin was not intending for this to be a spiritual metaphor, it is true that Jesus wants his sheep to be well armed. And that is why he was sounding out the warning so that we would not be taken in by every wind of doctrine and every new and sensational teaching or ministry that is out there. Remember a number of years ago, probably somewhere around 12 years now, that um, something sprung up in the United States. It was actually in the state of Florida. And uh, it looked like it possibly could be the next wave, the next revival that uh, people were looking for. And um, it was led by a particular leader who is actually from Western Canada, uh, kind of an uh, ungainly type of person. And um, <clears throat> uh, I was watching it online from time to time, not, not night and day, but certainly tuning in just to see what was going on, monitoring it. And probably after a month or so, it got around, it was all over the internet, and some people even in our own church came to me and said, Pastor, when are we, you know, when are we going to make a trip down there? When are we going to go get in on this? And I said, well, not, not anytime soon. And they kind of looked at me, and they said, well, you know, don't you believe this is God? And I said, well, it might be, but you know what? It takes time to determine whether something is of God. And I like to take some time and sniff it out, discern it, pray about it, get a feel for it, hear what they're doing, watch what they're doing, and give it some time to see what emerges. And so one time I tuned in and this leader was being ordained and, you know, every major charismatic leader in America was on the platform, you know, getting their face in. They wanted their picture to appear with this young revivalist who's seemingly leading the next wave. <clears throat> and... They were, you know, praying for him and prophesying over him and this and that and the other thing. And, of course, wanting to get in on it. It was a short time. And that whole thing imploded. It imploded. The leader had a moral failure, young leader. And there were leaders, major leaders, who were taking criticism prior because of what they saw on the Internet and they were saying, oh, well, we know him and his wife and his kids, and we can vouch for him, and da-da-da-da-da. Guys put their neck out there all the way for him. And it was quite evident that they didn't know what was going on in his marriage, and they didn't know uh, really very much at all. And uh, the, whole thing, the whole thing died. And so, but people were swept up in the sensational, you know, wow, look what's going on there. And, and you know, Christians can easily be uh, led, blown about by winds of doctrine. In fact, I remember teaching a series uh, for about 10 weeks after that called Winds of Doctrine, trying to help people understand why I didn't get in on it and why I'm glad I didn't, because it takes time to discern something. You know, <clears throat> so as I said, wolves, and this guy was a wolf, in inwardly he was a ravenous guy he was he was going after stuff and consuming stuff and it was wrong um and i haven't really heard much of him since and that was 12 years ago so wolves 
do not contribute. They only consume. And the other thing that I've noticed about wolves, and uh, this is just something that I've observed over a lifetime you know, uh, in, of ministry and being a Christian, is that wolves are not big fans of shepherds. Shepherds guard and keep sheep. Wolves scatter and consume them for their own purposes. They always have a hidden agenda. And so when I find that people are not very interested, and I watch people, obviously, and particularly people who have, you know, a lot of charisma, a lot of seemingly like they are really, you know, gifted and they want to get involved and they seem eager to get, you know, a place of leadership. But if I notice that they're not interested much in connecting with me, then all of a sudden there's an inter internal radar that goes up. And so the passage we looked at last week uh, warned us not to be judging or condemning. However, Jesus did not mean by that to be undiscerning, undiscriminating, and naive in terms of a person's life and fruit. In fact, that's exactly where he takes us. We are not allowed, uh, or I'm sorry, we are allowed and encouraged to be fruit inspectors. How do we inspect fruit? Well, I want to give you a few points here. Number one, we examine the track record. Yes, I cannot judge your heart motives. That is a no-fly zone for us as believers. We are not to judge the why uh, or affix a motive as to why a person is doing uh, or acting a certain way. We can't read their heart. Only God is able to read people's hearts. We are unable to look inside and see the heart motivation. But what we can do is we can look at a person's track record and we're encouraged to do that. If a person has a track record for being uh, unreliable, untruthful, undependable, insincere, selfish, crude, arrogant, unwilling uh, to submit to any authority, rebellious, uncaring, greedy, unwilling to lay down their life for the greater good of others, immoral, uh, any, any three or four of those in combination, if they're unchecked and are not changing, would be enough to establish a track record of bad fruit. Again, we're not talking about someone who is uh, otherwise got an unblemished record and they, they fall into temptation. They fall into something. But we're talking about a track record uh, reveals a pattern that emerges over time. Track record reveals a pattern that emerges over time. So that is why we cannot be quick to judge. We must not be quick to judge. And it's okay to wait. If something's really of God, it's not going away. So, you know, if something breaks out tomorrow and there's some great thing that God is doing somewhere, you know, you don't have to be the first one there. You can take some time because I can only imagine in the situation that I described uh, that people flocked to these meetings that were uh, down in Florida and they, they were flocked to the... Uh, network that was carrying them and they were watching them day and night and people were buying in. I can't imagine how disappointed, let down, disillusioned all those people were when the person leading it and all the supposedly top leadership of America standing behind him, endorsing him, didn't have enough discernment to pick up on what was really happening in this person's heart and in, the, and in his life. So we need to watch, pay attention to track records. Number two, we get recommendations. In the early church, uh, they were called commendations. And it, it's evident that they wisely required commendations or recommendations from well-established leaders before accepting a person who had a ministry to come into their church and share. That person had to have someone speak on their behalf. And where there is no track record to observe, we need someone uh, who knows and, and who we know and trust and can speak for that person. Paul uh, wrote to, to his, own, his own church, the Corinth, and uh, at Corinth, and he said, do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need, as some others, letters of commendation? Letters of commendation from you. You are our epistle. 
written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, on the heart. Paul was literally saying to them, look, you are my epistle. I wrote it. It wasn't with ink, but it was written in the ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on a tablet of stone, but written in, in your heart. And you are read and known by all men. And, and I planted this church. I came and brought the gospel to you. So do I need now to commend myself to you? I laid the foundation. You know, I planted. Others came and watered and God gave the increase. But you are the epistle that I wrote. You're my fruit in the Lord, he says in another place. And, uh, you know, some people who knew all the stuff that was happening at the church in Corinth would, would wonder why, why Paul would even admit that. So then this church had so many issues. Why would Paul even admit that they belong to him? But he, he's saying to them here, do I need a, a letter of commendation? And so the point is, is that they required that in the early church. They didn't just let every person who walked through the door uh, minister in the church. They wanted letters of commendation. They wanted to know who they were, what their fruit was, who, what kind of uh, credentials they came with, and what they brought, who would speak on their behalf. So that is number two. Number three, we taste the fruit. Not the gift, not the ability, not the charisma and the charm of a person, but the fruit of their life. What has that person produced? How is their spouse doing? How many spouses do they have? <laughs> or have they had? <laughs> How is their children doing? What would a co-worker say about that person? What do others who have interaction with them say? Do they serve willingly and humbly? Are they teachable and correctable? Are they pushy, domineering, demanding, disrespectful towards others? Do they have followers? Is there anybody following them? And if they do, what are they like? Are they negligent and uncaring and unkind? You know, you get to taste the fruit. We're allowed to inspect the fruit. You know, um, I've been here in Midwestern Ontario pastoring this church for over 20 years now. And I would have to say that Crossroads Life Church is a large part of my fruit. Now, I have fruit beyond this church because I've always traveled and I've always been, uh, you know, many people have invited me to come to their churches and minister and speak or share, uh, whatever. And so there's fruit that abounds to my account in many, many other places around the world and around the country. Uh, but my main, probably my main fruit over the last 20 years would be this church. And so, you know, it's a matter of looking at this church and saying, well, what kind of church is it? Are they loving? Are they gracious? Are they kind? Are they hungry for God and truth? Uh, are they uh, willing to reach out to other people? Are they embracing of uh, people? Are they, are they people who are eager to pray and seek the face of God and they love Jesus and they love one another? Are they in unity? You know, all these things, all these qualities, what is the fruit like? If you walk into a church and it's chaos and people are infighting and, and uh, they're unkind and they're ungracious and no one will talk to you and everybody's just there to get what they want and then they run out the door. I've been in churches like that. Jan and I have visited churches where you could shoot a cannon off five minutes after the service. Everybody's gone. And they don't connect with one another. It's just like they're there to, for what they can consume. It's a, called a consumer church. Well, hopefully that's not what we've developed. I don't believe it is. But the point is, that I'm trying to make, is that this church would be a reflection of who we are. And so one commentary that I read on this passage said, the focus is on the quality of the fruit. And these are the different words that are used uh, in different translations. Spoiled fruit, worthless fruit, evil fruit, bad fruit. And here it indicates bad or worthless fruit. 
I'm sure we've all had the, you know, the occasion of having a basket of, I, I, peaches are probably one of the quickest fruits to spoil, and, and you get a peach, and it's really soft and gone brown and, and mushy, and it's bad. It, you don't want to eat it. You're not going to chew on that. Uh, there are different kinds of fruit here resemble each other. The different kinds of fruit here resemble each other. But as you judge the fruit, one is poor in quality. Secondly, the focus is on the taste of the fruit. Is it, uh, it is fruit that tastes bad or that no one wants to eat. So, you know, you, you can taste, you can have a interaction with a person and you get a taste of what that person is like and you go, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not eating that fruit. You know, you walk into a situation, you can walk into a church and you can taste, you can taste the atmosphere, you can taste the people, you can taste the, what's going on there and how they treat one another and, and what their reputation is in the community. So again, these are all areas that we are, we are encouraged to taste the fruit and be fruit inspectors. So let's look finally at what Peter wrote in his second epistle regarding false teachers. Jesus was talking about false prophets. Now Peter kind of writes a little bit here on false teachers and I think he says some really uh, very important things that we need to understand. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 he says, but there were also false prophets among the people, speaking of ancient Israel. Even as there will be, he pre he's predicting, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Now, Peter refers to the damage done by false teachers. He gives us four things that we need to guard against that this is what will be the result of false teaching or false teacher. They bring swift destruction upon themselves. Um, secondly, they lead others into those destructive ways. Maybe it wouldn't be so bad if it was just themselves that they're just responsible for themselves. But unfortunately, they lead others into those destructive ways and they wind up in the same situation. And that obviously is not where you and I want to wind up. Thirdly, they bring the way of Christ into disrepute. And I can't think of anything more horrible than as a, as a teacher or as a pastor to wind up bringing the name of Christ into disrepute that people are actually turned off from Christ and turned off from the church because of the behavior of the church or its teachers. And I, you know, unfortunately, we have a large sample of examples that we could draw from and talk about, which I will not do today. But certainly, there have been way too many pastors, leaders, evangelists, teachers who have gotten themselves into all kinds of trouble and have brought the way of Christ into disrepute until finally, really, our culture is not so open anymore and does not esteem uh, Christian leaders or the church because of so many things that they have seen Christians and church leaders do. And so this is, this is really bad because we're working against ourselves. We're trying to penetrate the, the culture with the gospel and what we're doing is actually turning people off. And, uh, not, and I'm not just talking about, the, you know, the style of preaching or something. I'm talking about, you know, being false. This is the result of being false. And then finally, letter D, they exploit people with deceptive words. They exploit people with deceptive words. They actually deceive. They use the Bible, but they don't exegete. Uh, they eisegete. 
You know, exegesis is the opening of the scripture like I am today and opening it to you, exposing it to you and exegeting it, helping you to understand what it means, what it says and what the writer intended by it. That's exegesis. But eisegesis is where I read into the scripture what I want you to believe. And it might not be what the Holy Spirit meant or what the writer meant. It's just what I want you. I'm trying to deceive you with deceptive words, but I'm using scripture to do it. And there's unfortunately no shortage of that also. So those are the four things that are a result of false teacher. Now, um, Peter also gives the four, four main earmarks of false teachers. How can you know them? How can you know that they're operating among you? And that false teacher might not be someone who is a teacher recognized in the church, but I have found that there's people sometimes in the church who they are trying to lead people off. And so letter A, they operate in secret. And let me say this, if someone invites you to a meeting at their home or starts circulating books and teaching, the first thing to ask is, does the pastor know about this? And you may say, well, I've had all kinds of people give me books. Well, th that's fine. And I'm not telling you that uh, you can't read any other books than what I'm recommending. I'm just saying that there are some people who will hand out books and they have a different emphasis than what the church actually teaches or would approve. And sometimes it's a good thing to ask, well, you know, has the past, do you know if the pastor's read this church or have you offered this book to the pastor? And if they say no, you might want to say, well, why? And, and why would you do that? Well, as I said earlier, shepherds, uh, are there to safeguard your, your soul. We are, watch for your soul. Pastors are shepherds appointed by Christ. And if they do not uh, want us to know what they're doing, there must be a reason for it. And, uh, you know, I'll spare you some of the details of what I've run into over the years. But many times, people are operating in secret. And pastors are not aware of what's going on. And, and then letter B, they bring in destructive heresies. Now, I've seen this happen right here at CLC, and several people were affected by it, and uh, they're no longer with us as a result. And heresy, by the way, is not really what many people have become accustomed to thinking it. The actual meaning of heresy is sect, division, Religious party, like as in a, uh, a political party, you know, you've got in Canada about five different uh, political parties, maybe six, and they're all different parties. They, they se they're separate from each other, and they all have their thing that they're pushing. Well, you can have religious parties, and they are pushing this and creating a sect, a division, a separate group, a dissenting faction. This word did not have a doctrinal application until after the first century. It was, it was actually used by Josephus, a uh, writer in the first century, to describe all the different sects of Judaism. So heresy is not just a teaching. It is that which brings division, that which causes religious parties and sectarianism and separate groups and dissenting factions. Well, we don't believe that. You get people into this, this uh, you know, fight and, and doctrinal uh, fight and dissenting faction within churches. And, and in the group that, that uh, I had the misfortune of having in our church was, uh, <laughs> was a quite actually very kind of lovely, innocent-looking young mother who, who, unbeknownst to me, for two or three years had been holding uh, secret, clandestine meetings uh, in her home and feeding people a doctrinal emphasis that I definitely would not be in favor of. And uh, I think she knew that, and she kept it well out of my sight and from me. And, but she was recruiting people and uh, young mothers, and of course they were taking it home and feeding it to their husbands, and all of a sudden there was this faction in the church of people who were all about this teaching. And then one day, um, we were at a family camp, and she, she, we got a, just a little talk, and she said, you know, Pastor, we're praying for you. 
I said, wow, thank you so much. Uh, but I felt there was something behind it. So I said, well, um, is there something particular you're praying for? And she said, yeah, we're just praying that you'll become open. I said, open? Really? Gosh, I, I thought I was one of the most open people. You know, I'm, I'm open, man. Open, 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 open to what? And she said, well, you know, open to some of the teaching that, that we uh, are, uh, you know, kind of into. And right away, I could see the writing on the wall. So I said, well, gosh, who is we? And she said, well, you know, there's a lot of people who are unhappy. I said, really, a lot of people? And she said, you know, yeah, I think if, if there isn't a change, you're probably going to lose at least half of your church, maybe more. I said, really? Really, I'm going to lose half of the church? I just said to her gently but kindly and firmly, I said, honey, listen, there's no danger of me losing half of this church or anywhere near it, and I'll tell you why. Because we have built on the solid word of God. And we have built on the spirit. And we have built on truth. You know, we have built on good foundations that are Christ. And when you build on that, no one is going to be able to tear it down. The enemy can try, but it's not going to happen. We, we're, we're the house that's built on the rock. And so I just assured her of that and said, Thank you very much, but uh, you don't need to pray about that anymore. I think I know who you're talking about, and you're right. I'm absolutely not open to that teaching. I didn't use the word heresy. I went away, and I started praying, and uh, immediately the Lord said, you have a faction in this church, and this is what you need to do to address it. So, as it all turned out, there were about three or four families that got together, and yeah, they, they uh, all kind of exited together, and they were part of that faction. I've never heard of any of them since. I have no idea where they are, what they're doing, or even if they go to church. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but it comes in with people trying to push their secret agenda secretly, not connecting with the shepherd, not connecting with the pastor, not having their works being done openly. They don't come into the light. They're hiding something. Um, let her see. Peter says the underlying motivation is greed and covetousness. Interestingly enough, most of the teaching that they were pushing was based on greed and covetousness. It, it, it went like this. You know, this, the Bible teaches that godliness with contentment is gain. Godliness with contentment is gain. But there's teaching out there that more looks like Gain with some godliness or with, uh, with contentment is gain. So they turn that around. And uh, really, it's, it's unfortunate, but many people fall into that. And so the underlying motivation is greed, it's covetousness, it's wanting to get, wanting to gain. And then letter D, they operate in deception and are manipulative. And uh, this is certainly was the case. And, and is the case, unfortunately, in many churches. It's very similar to a warning that Paul gives Timothy. And Paul prophesies. And he says, the time will come. This is going to happen. The time will come. And people will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 2 Timothy 4, 3-4. They will, according to their own desires, they want, they've got an itch in their ear and they want it scratched. They want to hear this particular teaching. They want to hear this emphasis. And you're not giving it, Pastor. You're not serving it up. All you're doing is teaching the Bible. And so they heap up for themselves. Notice that. They heap up for themselves teachers. And this group had all these teachers they named off who, the, oh, you know, we need to listen to this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. And they heaped up themselves, all these teachers for themselves, so that they could get that scratch in their ear. 
But you know what? It's not sound biblical instruction. It is heresy. And it created a faction. And that's the fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. So rather than being in unity and loving, just loving the word of God and loving the teaching of the word and solid teaching of the word, they wanted something more sensational and certainly something that would feed their own desires. In summary, do we have itching ears that have to hear a certain message or we're not happy? Is that, is that the way it is? That you, if you don't get your message, you, if you don't get that fix, you know, this is my message, you know, I need it every, you know, every Sunday I got to have this. And, and if you're not preaching this, you know, hmm. Got my shot, I'm okay. Are we heaping up teachers for ourselves? Are you, are you off on some tangent and you're reading and watching all these guys who are focusing on one thing? Are we being pulled? Are you being pulled into a faction through a false focus? These are things that Jesus said you need to guard against. Are we checking the fruit of those who claim to be something? You know, people who claim that they have the word and they're this and, you know, we have it and we have the wisdom. We are the people. Wisdom will die with us. And finally, are we inspecting it before we jump into it? Are we giving it prayer and discernment? And uh, a wise person will look well to his going. They won't just jump into everything that is sensational and everything that is whipping them in, people into a frenzy or it seems to be highly stimulating or someone who's got a lot of charisma, you know, and they just pour that charisma on every time they open their mouth and they got so much charisma, it's like syrup and it pours out everything. And really what you're buying into is the charisma of the leader rather than the teaching of Christ. So, brought you this message today. We want to keep it real, right? We want, to, we want to keep it real. Do we love the basic teaching of Scripture? Or are we hankering for something that's going to entertain us or, or you know, whip us up? Uh, or that's focusing on one promise to the exclusion of the rest of Scripture? I call that a false focus. You know, and there's lots of teaching out there that has a, a false focus. It's always hitting this one thing. I remember this one pastor who's very popular now, and um, I listened to him, but every time I listened to him for years, there was one word that always came up in his teaching. And I just thought, you know, you're, you're lopsided. You know, you, you, it's like the whole house is built on this one thing. And um, the only one thing that we need to be building on is Christ. Building on Jesus. Building on him. He is the rock of our salvation. He is the solid one. So let me pray as we close today. And I pray that if, if this teaching has uh, corrected you, if it's challenged you, if, if you see someone out there who's trying to pull you into something or circulate doctrinal, a doctrinal emphasis that you don't hear from this pulpit and you're part of CLC, maybe it'd be good for you to talk to the pastors and have a discussion. I'm not preaching this because I'm aware of anything like that. I, I don't think there's anything out there, but I just, you know, I'm, I'm sounding out the warning and keeping it real so that we can really... Uh, be a people who walk together in unity and focused on building the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we thank you today for the word of God that comes to us that is like a two-edged sword. And it can, it can sometimes cut us. It can sometimes wound us. But Lord, if it wounds us, it's in order to heal us. It's like a surgeon where the surgeon has to cut, but he's trying to remove something in order to bring healing. And so if anybody was cut with this today, Lord, I just pray your healing bomb. I pray that they will receive it 
as like a surgeon's cut to remove anything that might be detrimental or to sound out the warning of the false teachers, the false prophets, and the false Christs. And so, Father, we thank you today, we praise you today, we bless you today, and we're thankful that you're leading us and guiding us into all truth. In Jesus' name. And I want to encourage you today, if you're watching, if you have never uh, connected with Jesus Christ, if you are watching today and you have never, ever uh, received the invitation that Jesus issues to you, Jesus said, come unto me. Come unto me. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through me. And so, if you have never received the invitation that Jesus issues to you to come to him, then today is your day. And all you have to do is open your heart to him. Ask him to come in. Ask him to come into your life. Ask him to be your Lord, your Savior. Uh, obey the gospel. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, and you will be saved. That's what the Bible teaches. Very simple. Repent of your sin. Turn. Make a new direction. Turn away from uh, whatever it is you're doing, and turn towards God through Christ. Be water baptized in obedience to His Word, so that you're baptized into Christ. And then continue to follow Him, and connect with His house, His people, His church and become a follower of Jesus. That's it's that simple. And if that's you today, and if you have never prayed to invite or to respond to his invitation, why don't you pray with me right now? Why don't you take a moment and just pray with me? And uh, we'll just pray after these words after me. And if that's you, you can also hit the button uh, that you see where you want to connect with God. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you today. We know that you have given us Jesus Christ, your son, inviting us to come to you. And today, I want to respond to that invitation to come into Christ know him as my savior as my lord as the one who died for my sins and as the one who can give me life god i thank you i praise you and i ask you to come into my heart my life do a work in me make me your child send me your holy spirit and help me to obey the gospel of Jesus so that I might have eternal life. I thank you for it. Amen. God bless you. Thank you all of you who are tuning in today and watching this broadcast. I pray God's richest blessings upon your life and upon the week ahead. And go out from wherever you are and just share the love of God with people. Walk in the peace of God and walk in his truth. The Lord is with you. The Lord bless you and keep you in Jesus' name. Amen.